Today is February 2nd, 2024, 12.30 p.m. And we are here at the Center for Sacramento History in Sacramento, California. Please state your full name, legal name, and spell it. Arturo, A-R-T-U-R-O, Abraham, A-B-R-A-H-A-M, Aleman, A-L-E-M-A-N. Please provide your date of birth, month, date, and year. June 28, 1949. I'm old. <laughs> and where were you born? San Diego. Right. San Diego, California. Uh, what is your marital status? I'm currently single. And uh, do you have children? And if so, how many? I have four kids, uh, three daughters and a son. And what are their names? My oldest daughter's name is Xochiquetzal, and I should spell that for you. It's X-O-C-H-I-Q-U-E-T-Z-A-L. Thirteen letters, none repeated. <laughs> Xochiquetzal Aleman Proc. Okay. And the second one is Chantico Itzalaiwatl, Itzalaiwatl, uh, Aleman. And uh, let's see, I should spell that. C-H-A-N-T-I-C-O. Uh, I X T L A C I U T A L. Yeah. And Aleman. And the Here's third that. one is Amasaya Itzli Matsli. H A M A S A Y A Itzli Matsli. I X T L I M A T L I. And my son's name is Olin, O L I N, Netzawalkoil. And that's uh, N E T Z A. H U A L C O Y T L. I love that. <laughs> Aleman. Aleman. <laughs> um, where were you raised? Interestingly enough, um, I was born in San Diego and raised in Otay, between Otay half the year and Solana Beach the other half, in a place called the Eden Gardens and, of course, Otay up in the hills. Mm -hmm. And how many brothers and sisters do you have? I have six brothers and sisters, uh, two brothers and four sisters. I have two older sisters, two older brothers, and two younger sisters. And uh, did any of them go into the service? The three of us were in the service, the three boys were in the service at the same time. And because I was in Vietnam, they didn't have to go, which was good. So what are their names? My oldest brother's name is uh, Ap uh, Apollos, but we call him Paul. Aleman, my next brother's uh, Alberto, and we call him Al Albert, and Aleman, and that's my two brothers that were in the service at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, you were how old when you went into the service? I got drafted at 19 years old. And so you said your other sibling. I actually two? turned 19 in the Army. Got it. Your, your two other brothers that also were in, so they came in after you? No, they came in before. Before. Yeah, my oldest brother is uh, three years older, and my next brother is two years older than I am. And uh, they went in, and I got drafted after they went in. Okay. Um, how many, uh, what was the primary language growing up? Uh, Spanish. Spanish. And your parents are from where? <clears throat> my father was born in El Rosario, Sinaloa, and my mother is a seventh generation Californian. Please explain your experiences growing up. Well, very interestingly enough, I, uh, I was, like I said, raised between Otay and Solana Beach. Uh, in Otay, we lived about uh, a quarter mile from the Mexican border. We could see Tijuana from where we lived. We lived in a pretty poor town of pretty pretty poor part of San Diego at the time, and uh, I had free range. I mean, I it was a country boy and I wandered around a lot and out in the country. And then the other part of my life was every year was spent with my uh, at my grandmother's house. They had an adobe that was built many many years ago. I don't know, over a hundred years ago, and uh, spent a lot of time. We were about a mile from the beach, and so we spent every waking hour 
of the summers at the beach. Mm -hmm. My grandpa would load the truck up with a bunch of kids and he'd go very slowly over the hill, drop us off at the beach at about 10 o'clock in the morning and come back around six o'clock in the afternoon and back home. It was a lot of fun. I had a really great youth. Good, good. What did your parents do for a living? Uh, my father was a laborer, worked in a member of the uh, laborers union, and my mother was a homemaker, and uh, she also helped my dad uh, with income. She'd get up at about 3.30 in the morning and make about two dozen tortillas to make into burritos that my dad would take to lunch with him and sell them to the guys he worked with. Mm -hmm. So when they came home, he'd come home with a little bit enough money to buy for the next day and a little bit of money left over. To feed seven, the kids. Seven kids. <laughs> yeah. My dad was the only worker yeah, that brought that. income in. But he was also uh, an evangelist. Mm. He uh, was... Uh, very active in his church. That's how my mom and dad met, and uh, very active. And throughout his whole life, he retired as a pastor, yeah. starting a church of uh, Oaxaqueños in King City. Ended up being a pretty large church, about a couple thousand, thousand people. Yeah. But I left. I'm irreligious myself. I was going to bring my dog tag, which has agnostic on it. I kind of doubted the need for religion, I never doubted that a God exists. Mm -hmm. I understand. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, can you tell me a little bit about how it was growing up? Uh, you said you grew up in a in the poor part of San Diego and then you spent the summers pretty much at the beach. But like, do you remember anything in terms of like when you were in school? If you yes, school was a lot of fun. I went to John J. Montgomery, which is again within eyesight of Tijuana, and most of the kids I went to school with were Mexican, and we'd get in the usual typical little boy fights after school and run around and play the rest of the time, and it was just a very uh, happy time of my life. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if you probably didn't experience discrimination because everybody else is Mexican in the school. and Yeah, I didn't experience uh, discrimination really overtly until I went to uh, junior high school. But I went to junior high school in San Luis Obispo, which is an all-white community, and very wealthy. And, of course, we weren't wealthy. So it was uh, interesting to run up against it. So can you tell me a little bit about like what kind of stands out in your mind as an example of that discrimination or? Um, <clears throat> I couldn't go home from work, I mean from school, any day without eventually getting into a fight with somebody coming over wanting to bully me. But then again I've been kind of rowdy my entire life so I grew up in, a, in an area where like I said before, little boys go out and fight. I mean, it was not uh, unusual. And um, so I, uh, it wasn't unusual to have it happen all the way through high school until I got into, uh, when I was in high school, in my sophomore year, the wrestling coach came to me and said, hey, you like to fight? And I said, no, I don't. I just, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let somebody beat me up. He says, well, join the wrestling team and nobody will bother you anymore. And so I did, made varsity right away, so that was pretty good. Um, yeah, so that was a big change, but mm -hmm. the, the discrimination continued. I never went out with any of the girls in high school. They were all white and they didn't want to go out with me anyway. And I remember going to one girl's house and uh, we were in the kitchen and she was cookies and milk and the mom came in and says make sure you take your trash out and so I'm going like oh, not good <laughs> mm -hmm. and so I left uh, I really never talked to her even though she was very friendly and still is very friendly toward me but I just never liked going around her house mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did your parents ever talk to you about that you're Mexican that you're this, that, or did they ever, I don't know how it was back in those days in well, terms of conversations about that or? In the early, mid-50s, 
My parents joined the community services organization. I don't know if you know what yes, that is. Yes, I do. I have their card, actually. I, I, uh, they joined that and were very active. They, were, they knew Cesar very well. Mm. Um, and so they were activists. My dad used to say, I'll feed the soul and you feed the body. Because she always had a pot of food going on, frijoles and tortillas or whatever. And I recall uh, we always had itinerant people coming through. I mean, hobos would stop by the house and she'd feed them. And then she'd make them listen to my dad. <laughs> he was always uh, doing his thing. But they were, they were like a team. They were really worked it. And uh, so, yeah, that was, mm -hmm. that was an interesting part of my life. I remember one time I gave up my bed to a woman that was coming through, and well, I, re I recall to this day, boy, she needed a shower in the worst way. And I'm sure my, I mean, by the time she left, of course, she had cleaned up, but man, when she arrived and laid in my bed, I couldn't sleep in my bed for a couple of days. Um, but that was the kind of people my parents were. Wow. I always had food, always had doors open. In San Luis Obispo, the very first uh, um, Equal Opportunity Commission office was in my parents' living room in San Luis Obispo. It's now a huge organization, but that first time. And uh, that was really interesting because the Head Start started through that program. And I ended up being uh, an empl employed by the Head Start program. Mm -hmm. When you were a teenager? I was 17. So um, <laughs> what took your parents to, or your family to San Luis Obispo? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, my dad got a job as a janitor at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And of course our life changed significantly after that. My dad had a permanent monthly check. We had had... Uh, medical services, and it was much more stable. Prior to that, it was a little bit hit and miss. And we, did the tr we did the crops in Sanger and around Santa Maria and all that. I remember picking potatoes when I was 12 years old. And you used to have a, a belt you put around your waist with two hooks on it, attach a 100-pound bag of burlap, and then you go crawl across the the row and throw potatoes in it until it filled you back up tied it up and next bag mm -hmm. of course i didn't do as many as the grown-ups did but it was still back raking work of course of course they didn't have child labor laws then did they well not for mexicans not for farm worker <laughs> kids yeah <laughs> um so <laughs> You graduated from high school? I did. I went, graduated from high school. San Luis Obispo High School at the time was the richest high school in California. We had a planetarium, if that tells you anything. I mean, plan, school, high schools don't have planetariums. We did. We had two Olympic-sized swimming pools, eight tennis courts. We had uh, a gym for the basketball players and another gym for the football players. I mean, it was a rich school. Mm -hmm. It's changed, I think, but... When I went there, it was brand new and a lot of rich kids. I remember all the kids used to come to school in their muscle cars. Of course. And their Camaros and yeah. Pontiacs and all that. And I came to my 1937 pickup <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you had a crank to start. And uh, what year did you graduate? 1967. I graduated, um, went to work at a place called General Fireproofing, building metal desks. And, uh, and then I actually uh, went down to Santa Barbara uh, to uh, check out UCSB, but I never went to school. So the guy that ran the EOP program came and told me, go to class or you're done. So three months later, I was done. Went back to San Luis Obispo. Mm -hmm. And um, so at this time, Vietnam is, is going. Did yeah. you hear about it in high school? Do you remember having conversations about it? or? Actually, not really. Um, again, I didn't have a lot of friends into high school. I had some, but not, and we weren't very well focused on, on uh, Vietnam. We were more focused on raising hell. And so basically I was with, ran with the, bad boy crowd. Most of my friends were from another high school 
uh, down the road. It was called Arroyo Grande High School, which had a lot of uh, Latinos in it, a lot of Mexican kids. In those days, everybody was Mexican. We didn't call each other Latin or I got called you. each other Mexicans. Yeah. And um, so how, how is it that, are you drafted into Vietnam or what happens? Well, interestingly enough, yeah, I went to, back to college, but I carried a 1.14 grade point average, which as you know, is really spectacularly failing. And uh, they drafted me. And uh, what happened is, is that I got my induction, I had induction notice and then during that time, I got stopped by the police with pot in my car. And when I went to the judge, he said, hey, uh, you're going to jail? I says, why not just let me go to Vietnam? And he did. And so I went into the Army. Mm -hmm. When I went in the Army, I, I took two tests that were I did very well on. One was the Army Alpha, which is the basic one they give to everybody. I, did so well that they said, oh, let's give you the Army Beta, which is a next level exam. And they found out that I had an aptitude for cryptology or cryptography, crypto. And uh, I had good skills. I could type 45 words a minute, which was unusual for anybody in my age at the time. And um, I had another thing that I have that ended up on my on my MOS, and that is I have a facility for languages. I can pick them up really quick. I forget them almost as fast, but I can pick up a language pretty quick. So I ended up going through um, radio school, operating radios in the field, like this guy here in this picture. Mm -hmm. show you that. Yeah, and uh, did that, and then a radio teletype, which is another totally different thing, and uh, cryptology. Mm -hmm. So I ended up with a top secret crypto clearance, which served me very well in my career afterwards. You have this experience with the judge, and then how, how do you tell your family? I mean, do you know what you're doing? I mean, do you know what, what? Actually, my sister and my mom were there in the courtroom with me when I did it, when I the, the judge said, hey, so. They knew. I had already gotten drafted anyway, so I mean, I was going to go. Mm -hmm. And in those days, there was no question if you were Mexican, you were going to Vietnam. There was no, there was no like, oh yeah, you get to go to Thailand or you get to go to Germany or wherever. You went to Vietnam. That was, that was a sentence usually. Yeah. So your your dad's a preacher. And does he sit down with you? Does he, is there a conversation? Do, does he talk to you about what's about to happen? Or No. Interestingly enough, um, they were very resigned to it. I had already had uh, about five or six of my cousins. I have a huge family in California. And about five or six of my cousins had already been drafted, of which two had been killed in Vietnam. So they pretty well were aware, and they knew I was. So they, they just did a lot of praying. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I was uh, re went through basic training and then went through uh, advanced training and radio school and all that. And then I was going to fly out of uh, out of uh, Oakland. They bus you to Travis, but before that, I. Um, hopped the fence and went to a big convention, religious convention that my parents were in. And uh, there was about, I don't know, a couple thousand people, maybe three or four thousand people there. And all the guys that were going to Vietnam, they brought them to the front, they prayed over them. And then uh, after that was over, I hitchhiked back to Oakland. The next day they took me to Travis and they have, two days after that I was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And. Um what what happens when you arrive in Vietnam? Well, let's see. We went commercial flight, which was, um, I think, a Pacific Southwest was the name of the airline. And uh, we landed in Tonsonut, which is an airbase near uh, Saigon. And they marched us off the airplane, and everybody's scared and wondering and looking around. And, you know, just very interesting part of uh, the whole experience. 
You get off and they march you directly onto a bus. And the bus has wire, chicken wire on the windows. And so you kind of get the hint that this isn't going to be a, this is not Disneyland. And yeah. so you're on and they take you about 20 miles to a place called Long Bin, where it's the uh, transfer station for incoming and outgoing troops. And then from there, you spend two, three days. They issue you all your equipment, your weapon and everything. And then they send you off to um, your unit. Ended up at, uh, at Company A, 53rd Signal Battalion. And we provided uh, most uh, courier, land courier, radio teletype, a telephone, uh, radar, all that kind of stuff. All the electronic stuff that has to do with war was operated for second field forces out of that unit. And so I went to it and I, I, I arrived and first three or four days I just sat around because there was nobody even came and said hi. <laughs> just like, okay, welcome to Vietnam. And uh, waited. Finally they called me in. I said, okay, you have to report over to the radio rig. And so I went over there, and, and uh, in those days, well, I don't know about any, it's changed. But when I arrived, it was, the radio was, was a white boys game. I mean, that's where people were pretty safe, so they sent all the white boys there. But there was one guy, he was Puerto Rican, and he took me under his wing. He says, you're, gonna, you're new here, let me show you how you survive. And his name is Pablo Rosario. And Pablo, if I ever, you ever see you, and if I ever see you again, I'm going to give you a big hug. And where was Pablo from? Puerto Rican. Yes, I From know. the Bronx. Oh, from New York, yeah. Yeah, he's from the Bronx. In fact, I heard of a guy named Pablo Rosario being a big salsero, but I don't know if it's the same guy. I tried to follow up, but I couldn't get a hold of him. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm interested to, to hear about, you get there and is, like, is it racially mixed when you when you arrive, when you say nobody said hi to you? Is it? No, racially mixed was Pablo. That was it. But that was in the, <laughs> and the, in cooks, the radio. And the cooks, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the cooks, they were... They but you've were... been there before, meaning that's what you experienced when you went to... Oh, yeah. To... No, I... I, I so it didn't way, feel like a shock, or, no, or did it? No, no. In fact, uh, I've been pretty much a... Not a loner, but, I mean, very able to operate on my own. I feel very independent and I think yeah. they probably picked that up. That's because the people in the unit that I worked, they all did the same. They were the same kind of people. Uh, to give you an example, when I was 11 years old, I hitchhiked from Santa Maria, California to San Diego. I was 11 years old, it's 285 miles and I went by myself. So, I mean, I've been able to do that. You know, I, I, a lot of guys, they like hanging out with other guys and becoming a click and I've really never done that I have a lot of friends across cliques but I've never been a member of a clique yeah um, so tell me a little bit more about what what you experienced while you were at in Vietnam well <laughs> on my first week after I got assigned or after I, they told me this is where I, I, the captain of the unit of the 53rd Signal Battalion said, I need you to operate the radio and we are gonna go to Vung Tau. And I didn't know where Vung Tau was at the time, but Vung Tau was a resort right at the mouth of the uh, South China Sea and the Mekong River. And so we were gonna go there to offer some kind of radio support. On the way there, uh, I heard people shooting, so I, Pulled out my rifle and locked and loaded and shot the roof out of the jeep. And after that, the captain says, "Well, it's Cambodia for you, bub." <laughs> so he, he got me as far away from him as he could, and uh, I ended up uh, in a place called East Tainan. There were two. Tainan is a is a province, and in the province, the capital is Tainan. The city is named the same as the province. And on one end, on the west side of the of the city is a big, huge American military base. And on the other side is a provincial capital. And the provincial capital, uh, they had a uh, special forces unit there, uh, C team, which is not the people out in the field, but the A people come in also. 
and I was operating radios for them. I wasn't, in, I never had any special forces. I never did any of that. They just no said, combat. no, uh, except that we did have, my bunk got mortared while I was there. Not I was in it, I was gone and I came back and they had blown up my, my bed. Uh, that was interesting. And then we used to fly up and down to uh, Nui Baden, which is a mountain uh, right next to Tainin, Nin, and we'd fly up and fly down at day and night. It's kind of interesting to watch the tracers follow the, the helicopter. Uh, they missed most of the time, but uh, it was an interesting part. So I, I never was really with with Americans, except for the, the seven or eight guys that were in my little unit during that time that I was in Tainin and then before I went into Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And um, how long are you there in Cambodia? I went in in March, and then the American and Vietnamese together um, invaded Cambodia in April. So I was there in March, April, and I came back, uh, I don't know, late, May, or, uh, late April, early May. I came back before everybody else did. Um, one of the things that we used to do is they carpet bombed um, the what they call the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They'd carpet bomb it, and then we'd go and check out the damage. And um, that was a very, very harrowing experience because we, of course, if we engaged, we'd be dead. I mean, there was just too many people. It was just eight or nine of us would go check out, see what happened. I had an opportunity to see a village that got destroyed by carpet bombing. And that still gives me nightmares. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't engage anybody. I was just like, oh, shit, this is not good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm against war. I'm not a pacifist. I'm just against war. Yeah. Um, tell me about what you saw that changed you in that moment. Dead bodies, burn, stink. Mm -hmm. Did uh, you uh, suffer PTSD as a result of yeah. what you saw? Yeah, I still have nightmares. Did you? My wife left me because of that. Did you know it was PTSD? I mean, we didn't really talk about it much no. until... Recently. Yeah. I, I started going to the VA about three years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three years now. Okay. So you you said you, this is in May, and then you come back where? Where, where do you go? Oh, um, after, after that, I went to Swanlock, which is on the other end. Uh, we had a... A service area, I guess you can call it, and there were like ten different radio uh, operating stations, and I ended up going to like six of them. And I think I went to Swanlock after that. I went to Kuchi for a while. Um, I was assigned to the Vietnamese for a while. And then I went to I was assigned to the Australians for a while, and I was assigned to the Koreans for a while. And like I said, I pick up languages pretty quick, so uh, I was able to pick up Vietnamese and then uh, Korean. And of course, the Australians speak English, a funny English, but they speak English. <laughs> yeah, and so um, you served for how long in the Army? Two years. Just two years? Uh, yeah, I, I was drafted, so I only had to serve two years. I did my training, um, and that was like, I don't know, six, eight months. And then I went to Vietnam. And then they said, well, you get to go back to Augusta, Georgia, or you can stay here. And I decided to stay. So I came home for allegedly two weeks, but I spent 45 days. And FBI came and knocked on my mom's door and said, hey, where's your son? And she said, and then that night when I got home, she said, hey, they came looking for you. So I immediately reported back to Oakland and went back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you told me what year you got drafted. 1969. Uh, in fact, uh, like I, I think I told you, uh, I was in basic training when Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. No, you didn't tell me that. Oh, yeah. Basic training was where? 
Oh, Fort Ord. I got sick in Fort Ord. Uh, I got really sick. Uh, I, they put it down as rheumatic fever, mm -hmm. but the symptoms are pretty close to spinal meningitis, and spinal meningitis was really prevalent at Fort Ord, so I think I got misdiagnosed on paper. But they did everything that they did for people that had spinal meningitis at the time, which is give you dunks in ice water to keep the fever down. That was fun. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so I ended up a couple of weeks behind my regular group, but was fortunate because I got a chance to meet Oscar Urrea, who was one of my favorite friends, and still hang out. Well, we call each other. We don't hang out that much. Mm -hmm. And where's Oscar from? Oscar is from uh, Wincy, Mincy, Quincy, something like that in Arizona. There's a group of guys, about 18 guys that went to Vietnam from that little town, tiny little town, Mexican town. And uh, most of them got killed in Vietnam. Yeah. So, um, so then you, you're, you serve your two years and then what happens? Um, I came home. I came home. I, so I came, San Luis Obispo. Uh-huh, San Luis Obispo. And um, I went back to work. I went back to General Fireproofing, the place where I had left, mm -hmm. building desks. And they told Little me that, desks. yeah, they told me that they didn't have a job for me anymore. And they weren't hiring Vietnam veterans at the time back. I mean, a lot of Vietnam veterans came back and they were told like, ah, we don't think so. So I went to work, my sister, uh, had a uh, strawberry farm, and I went back and picked strawberries until I couldn't, f until I found out that I wasn't good for picking strawberries. Yeah. And so I decided I had at that point um, an option, go back to school, go back to college, or fail at picking crops. Arturo, if I may just put, go back a little bit. You're telling me that you went back to your old employer and they said they weren't hiring Vietnam vets. Can you tell us what that means? Well, they didn't tell me that they weren't hiring Vietnam vets, but I knew it because I got a letter from them. Sorry, but I, I, I had a letter from it. Um, sorry, but there's no jobs available, but I knew they were hiring other kids. Yeah. Do you want to just um, give us a little bit more reference as to why... What, what's happening in oh. society because, you know, this yeah. younger generation maybe doesn't... That's true. You're when, making assumptions during, about... It, that's true. The, um, during the Vietnam War, and especially toward the end of it or the middle of it, there was a lot of uh, opposition to the war. And a lot of veterans were coming back, and a lot of them had uh, a lot of us. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was one of them. Had a lot of uh, adjustment issues, you might call them. And uh, so it was not easy to come back and find a job because people that hired you before knew that you were a crazy Vietnam veteran, at least that was. And so we weren't being hired back to our jobs. And we pretty much knew that. But me, uh, I got very lucky. Uh, I decided to go back to school and on the GI Bill. Tell me what school. I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Yeah, the best, the jewel of the CSU system. Yeah, uh, and what did you study? I started out engineering. I started out uh, in uh, uh, IT. At the time, it wasn't called IT. I don't know what it was called. I don't remember. But I learned all the basic languages of the computer, where you had cards and all that kind of stuff. But, I call but it technology, since the school's called. Uh, well. Yeah, I don't know. Computer technology, let's say. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and that was what year? 70, I came back, 72, 72. By the way, I came back in April, and by the following January, I was married. By the following December, my first daughter had been born. Yeah. So um, I had to figure out a way to feed my family, and of course... Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about where you met your wife. I met my wife when uh, when she was graduating from high school. Uh, she's four years younger than I am, and my sister was in the grade with her, and they graduated together. And she said, "Oh, I'd like you to meet so and so." 
and I did. I got a little bit too frisky with her, but what the heck. And so I didn't see her until September, and then in September I walked into the EOP program because I wanted to go to Cal Poly, but I couldn't unless I got referred by our local community college. So I walked into the EOP office at Cuesta College, and there was a very pretty girl there. And I started talking to her and I asked her if she wanted to ride home from school and she said yes. I was surprised, but she said yes anyway. And so I uh, took her home and it turns out it was the same girl that I had gotten a little bit too fresh with it when she graduated from high school. Apparently I left an impression on her. She remembered I didn't. And, uh, and what then, is her name? Her name is Irma, Irma Mendes. Um, and she was a farm girl. Actually, she was from Mexico City, but her father died, and so she came to live with her uncle, and they came to, and they lived on a farm in Arroyo Grande. And uh, she was, that's where she lived. Mm -hmm. They didn't like me. So you, you got married? Got married. What year? 1972. And uh, I got a job. Also, the guy that, that referred me to Cal Poly, his name is Rod, was Rod Terr. He died recently, but we remained friends. Um, Rod Terr referred me to Cal Poly and referred me to a job with the California Department of Rehabilitation as a rehabilitation counselor trainee. And I went, I got the job, and I held that for a couple of years. Um, well, and I was married. Then I got married at the same time. All this is going on. I mean, it's a lot of stuff, but it didn't seem like it to me. And <clears throat> at the time, I didn't really need a lot of sleep. I slept like four hours a, a night. Yeah. And uh, I so. think I think it's also part of being a man, maybe in that era, and um, the way things are supposed to go. You get married, you right? Yeah. <laughs> All of these things happen at once. Yep, and they did. It was really interesting, um, looking back on it. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I kept that girl busy. <laughs> and we uh, had our first child. I had the job. I quit that job um, and went to work. Uh, I ran a campaign for a uh, board of supervisors for a, one of my professors at Cal Poly. He... Uh, he asked, we were talking, and I said, I can get people to walk your precinct for you. He says, I need $500. And I went and gave it, gave it to the Mecha kids. Or they weren't kids. They were all a bunch of Vietnam veterans also. And uh, I offered them $500 if they would work on the campaign, and they said yes. So we canvassed the entire district twice. And he won, and then he hired me as his chief of staff. And that was a lot of fun. I did that for a couple of years, and then uh, actually until I came to San, uh, Sacramento. What was his name? Dr. Richard Kresha. He was a Polish guy, he is, and we still remain friends also. I call him up about twice a year. He's in his 90s. Uh, really good guy. Mm -hmm. So you, how do you get to Sacramento? Well, um, what happened is I first came to Sacramento uh, on a uh, business trip for the county of San Luis Obispo. Uh, San, uh, Sacramento has a uh, uh, self-insurance policy and the insurance policy that the county of San Luis Obispo was paying was too high and they wanted to do an evaluation of the self-insurance program which I was doing as an analyst and uh, I came here and I kind of liked it. You know, I'm going like, oh yeah, I wouldn't. So I asked myself, where would you live? I said, well, I wouldn't live in Los Angeles. I wouldn't live in San Francisco. And that left, uh, and I wouldn't live in Fresno. So that left uh, San Diego and Sacramento at the time, just over 50 years ago. And uh, I ended up coming here and I had a friend, his name is Herman Sias. And I asked Herman, if he would help me, and Herman was the director of the Department of Motor Vehicles at the time. And so uh, we, he suggested that I get together with uh, somebody you might know. Her name is Jane Vargas, 
And Jane was a recruiter for the state at the time. And Jane uh, um, said, hey, I can get you in in a couple days. I said, well, let's, let's do it. So she says, you need to take a test. And uh, so I, she says, I can set it up for tomorrow. So you have to stay the night and, and we'll give you the test tomorrow. And, and uh, she and her husband at the time, Celso, who you might know also, they uh, invited me to stay at their home so that I could take the test the next day. The next day I took the test. The same day she gave me the, the results. And then she sent me to a guy named Ed Wilson at the Department of Parks and Recreation. He hired me on the spot. He said, when can you start? And I said, anytime you want. He says, come by in two weeks. And was, two weeks later, I was working in Sacramento. And are you with one child or did with the, the second? time I already had two. <laughs> the second already there. Okay, and, and so you, you you come to Sacramento and you move where? Ah, interesting. Yeah, the, I, <laughs> I I thought, well, the good schools are not where the Mexicans are. So let's go where the good schools are. And my kids will survive. One way or the other, they'll survive. And uh, so we moved to uh, Citrus Heights. Mm. And that's where we lived until it got to be an hour and 18 minutes to get to work. And I'm going like, that's 22 miles. It shouldn't take that long. So I bought a house in uh, Land Park. Nice, yeah. Um, do you want to tell me anything else about life in Sacramento? Well, I'll tell you, I, I've never met, prior to that, so many professional Latinos. And that was really a really great thing for me. Uh, I hung out with people like uh, Jane and Celso and Toddy and all these other folks that were really active at the time. We started an organization called Café de California. I ran against... Uh, Caroline Cabillas to be the first. She won, but then again, she was real tight with Toddy and Jane, and they were counting the votes. <laughs> and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Tell me what CAFE stands for. Ch uh, Chicano Advocates for Equality. That's what it was at that it was time. Just for the state. Yes. People who work for the state. For employees of the state. Mm -hmm. But it, they changed it later to just plain CAFE, because they got a lot of pushback. and they, they For wilted. the term Chicano? Or? And they wilted, so I got like... Right, uh, bunch of weenies. <laughs> so, uh, what do you identify as? Chicano. I actually I identify with my Native American roots quite a bit. My both my parents are Native American, so my mom on her so on her birth certificate doesn't say it just says Native American. What um, what tribe? Well, my on my mother's side. Yaki and on my father's side, uh, Ueme, which is Yaki, but, and, and Cora. His mm -hmm. mother was from uh, Nayari. Nayari, yeah. So, mushrooms, there we go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it's curi I'm curious just because the names of your kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, your wife, I mean, how, oh. does this, how does this come about that you, that you well, choose this for your, for your own children? I mean, did I was, that identification happened before you got married, or you know, the strong indigenous. The sort of strong thing? indigenous was before. Uh -huh. uh, we uh, we rel visited relatives on reservations and stuff. So, so I mean, I have strong, but the the Nahuatl names are from my wife. My wife's one hundred percent Nahuatl. Uh, she's Toltec actually. So her grandfather didn't even speak Spanish, and so we. Um, when the time came, I was studying anthropology. Oh, I had switched from engineering to sociology, and then a second as in, in Mesoamerican anthropology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to Mexico on the GI Bill, which was really nice. Back in the 70s, I made uh, about $830 a month on the GI Bill with two kids. And in Mexico at the time, it was like $8,000 a yeah, month. Yeah, that's a lot of money. And so I lived in a real nice part of Mexico City. In those days, um, it was called La Zona Rosa, which it still is, but it changed from families to uh, it's a, like the Castro area now. But in those days, it was a lot of families and 
kind of upscale. I had a car, which you know, a new car, and uh, so I stayed there and was studying an, uh, anthropology, and the names came up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but all of them have the Nahuatl names. This is before you got married, or while you're married? While I'm married. Yeah, so took, you took her with you to, uh -huh. to Mexico City? Back to her hometown. Actually, her, her family was down the road. Mm -hmm. um, what personal impact do you think your service has left on you? How, do you think it's a big part of your life still, or do you think it's... It is probably the seminal part of my life. Um, I... I Went in 19 years old and I came out 30 years old, even though it was only two years. I mean, it, I had a lot. When I came home, I was no longer a kid. I saw myself as having to get to get with it. And uh, that's why I went to college. And that's why I was working. Before that, I was a kid. I was, you know, smoking dope and having fun and going to concerts and going to go to the Cow Palace and watch 18 bands for three days and smoked out for the whole time. And when I came back, I no more pot, no more anything. I just dedicated to my family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do, your, do you speak <clears throat> about your service to your kids, or have you? No. Um, I did today. I went to breakfast with my son, and we chatted a little bit. About this interview, mm -hmm. yeah. What would you want your kids to know about about your service? I did what I had to do, and I had fun doing it while I could. And the shitty parts of it, are just the shitty parts of it. Life is that way. Sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's not so good. Don't lose your way. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say is the biggest lesson? War is shit. Mm -hmm. Bombing people is really shit. Yeah. When you watch the news today and you, you hear about war and, you know, it's so far away. Uh, Vietnam was so far away. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? or? Yeah. I relate a lot with the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What advice would you give somebody who is young and is thinking about going into the service? If that's what you think is important to you, do it. But just know that you're not going to be the same person coming out that you went in. And your chances of having a shitty experience are very high. But there are also some good things that come out of it. In my case, I I went from being a kid to becoming a man in a very short period of time. And the GI Bill. Um, and the GI Bill, which isn't available as much as it was yeah. now. Now you have to put in money into it so you can get the money out. Well, hell, you can do that anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious about um, your relationship with your parents after you came back. Did, and you had your family. Um, did you keep in close contact with them? Did you visit with them? Oh, yeah. Did they like coming to Sacramento? Um, Did they come visit? Or? Yeah, they came and visited. My parents are, um, were very, very, I was very close to them and my brothers and sisters, even the idiot Trumpers. What can you say? You can't have people think the way you do just because you want them to. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm still, we're still a very close family. Uh, we had a family reunion here in, in Sacramento, and everybody came from everywhere they were, and there was 245 of us. That's my siblings, their spouses, their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren. <laughs> we all got together. It was a lot of fun. It was great. You know, one of the reasons I... Um, did this interview is I wanted to give credit to some folks that aren't able to tell their story. Uh, my friends and relatives that have passed away that were Vietnam veterans. 
um, and others. But uh, I want to uh, say that I spoke on behalf of, of my friends and my family, uh, Pete Segundo, Phil Hernandez, Bobby Gonzalez, Bill Campos, and my other friends that have gone. I appreciate their work. I appreciate who they were.